Good morning and welcome to everyone joining us at home. And we continue today in our readings from Hebrews, from chapter 12, verses 14 to 29. So let's hear now from God's Word from Hebrews chapter 12. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the, the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures that remind us of your greatness and your glory and for, you, for the, the word that shows us your holiness. God, we pray that you would speak to our hearts this day, that you would draw us closer to you, but in a way that fills us with reverence and awe. For we pray this in Jesus' name. And we ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It can be so easy to take church for granted. Even for sincere believers, this is true. Now, it doesn't help that for those outside the faith, church can look like something that doesn't serve a purpose at all, and it's not nearly as entertaining as almost anything else they could find to do. And yet, even for those within the faith, even for us, church can easily be deprioritized. After all, every week has a Sunday, and so we think there will always be another opportunity to worship again. Church is seen as almost a, a common and ordinary thing that, that will always be there. Now I have to say that in recent months, the pandemic has probably shaken that view a little bit. It's now much more difficult for us to physically come to worship together. And so when we can finally gather, even at 30% capacity after two months apart, it's pretty special and we're happy to be here. Can I hear a muffled amen from under a mask? Yeah, yeah. And while after long periods of separation, we can see how church is special. God tells us through his word that church, that worship, is not something that's ever another ordinary thing to be taken for granted. God instead wants us to know how special and amazing worship is. There's more to worship than meets the eye. There's a spiritual reality that can't be seen, but is no less real than the ordinary appearance of the things you see right now. 
Right now, you just maybe see me standing up here behind a pulpit. Maybe uh, you see a screen beside me and uh, a black speaker on a shelf. And this may not look very exciting. Well, maybe the speaker, right? Someone on YouTube searching through all the videos that they, someone could watch, they're not going to look at a thumbnail for this video and think, well, we've recorded something really extraordinary. Look at that guy, amazing. They're more likely to, to move along and click on a picture of a lion biting a crocodile or something like that. Now, it does make me wonder if I, if I would get more views if I were to put up a, a title like Preacher Fights a Crocodile. <laughs> and then Photoshop myself with a crocodile in the thumbnail, you know, I do wonder sometimes if there are things I can do like that. But my point here is, is simply that worship is much more than meets the eye. There's much more to church than what the average person can see. And that's something we find in God's Word as we come to that final great contrast of the covenants in Hebrews chapter 12. In our passage today, we have some instructions based on that unseen spiritual reality of our standing in this new covenant. And so we see the contrast of, of two covenants represented by two mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. These are two covenants. Now, you should know by now, if you followed along a little bit in Hebrews, that there's been a number of contrasts in this book between two covenants. The first covenant being that one that was established at Mount Sinai. The mediator of that covenant was Moses. The requirement of that covenant was obedience to the law that God revealed. The, the promise was of a land to inherit. And of course, there was a death. There, was, there were sacrifices, animal sacrifices, that uh, really initiated and maintained that covenant and included people into that covenant. But the new covenant is different. Now, the new covenant is really the fulfillment of everything that God had been doing previous to it. And, of course, uh, a lot of the covenants you read about in the Bible are simply the terms of God's relating to people, and, and many of them can overlap. They're not mutually exclusive. And so people, even in the first covenant, ideally, were looking forward to this new covenant that would be uh, uh, more magnificent and more special in, in every single way. And for the first of all, it had a different mediator. The mediator was, of course, Christ. He's the one who, who brings the covenant to the people. It had a different requirement. Instead of obeying God's law and a set of rules and different types of laws, faith was required. Faith is required. And of course, people in the Old Testament had faith too, but this is how people enter in and receive the blessings of this new greater covenant. What else? The promise. The promise was better because it was an eternal inheritance. It wasn't just a land, a geographic space in which you could live and have crops and receive earthly prosperity. This was an eternal inheritance of the kingdom of God. And finally, the death of the sacrifice was much different because the sacrifice was of Christ himself. He is the one who offered his life on the cross, who died for our sins. And so that through faith in him, we would be a part of this new covenant. As Jesus said at the Last Supper, he took the cup when he was with his disciples and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. It was his death, it was his blood that initiated this new covenant, and it's by faith that we enter into it. Just as saints that have, through the generations, technically belonged to this covenant, but now, in this time, that covenant was fulfilled when Christ finally gave his life. And then Jesus rose again, then he ascended into heaven, and as we know, he's also better than any priesthood that existed before, because he's a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. But these contrasting covenants, what do we see? Well, we see that they are uh, going to be modeled by different mountains. In the Old Testament, you see that Mount Sinai is where this Old Covenant was initiated, but as you go through the Old Testament, especially the Psalms, you hear all these great things about Zion. Glorious things of thee are spoken. That hymn talks about Zion, 
the, the mountain of God. And some of them are so extraordinary, you'd say, why are they so big on a, on a single hill? And it's not even that big of a mountain. It's where the temple was, but even the, that city that talks about being forever and so wonderful, even that was temporary, but it spoke to something spiritual, to the dwelling place of God. It's an image for heaven itself, and it's also here an image for the new covenant under Christ. But if you're ever wondering, the idea of a new covenant is really not all that new. It was God's plan from the beginning. It was found even in the Old Testament, as we know, in Jeremiah 31, 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So this idea that there's this new covenant and there's an old covenant, that's not a, a, a novel idea. You can go back to the Old Testament and see that, ex that idea explicitly stated in Jeremiah 31, 31 and 32. This is a new covenant, not like the old one. It is really the one that people even back then, before Jesus ever came, centuries before, they would have been looking forward and believing in a new covenant. So here we have the two mountains, two covenants. If you've ever been at the foot of a mountain, there's nothing like seeing a mountain for the first time is there. We Ontarians, if you've lived in Ontario all your life, you finally go to BC or Alberta for the first time and you're like, what is that? I've never seen anything that gigantic and majestic and wonderful in my life. It is stunning. And then we think that's nice, but hey, we live in the center of the universe. Let's go back to Ontario. <laughs> right? But mountains are beautiful, aren't they? You can imagine the people, the Israelites, standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they're walking through the mountains of the Sinai Peninsula in the wilderness, and they, they are probably stunning, nevertheless, to look at, even if there's not a lot of life and vegetation in that region. Mount Zion would be a little different. That was the hill, not as quite as mountainous, but it was the hill on which the temple in Jerusalem was, was built. And that had much more religious significance because people would go up the hill to go to the temple, to offer their sacrifices. That's where all the sacred worship uh, that was prescribed by God would take place. But it had a, a very special spiritual significance. And so we have these two things, these two mountains, these, these, uh, that symbolize two covenants. We have Sinai and Zion. And we'll come to those in a moment. But first, let's look at the instruction that's based on the reality of being in this new covenant. What are we supposed to do? Why does that matter? Well, Hebrews 12, 14 tells us that we're, because we're in this new covenant, there's, there's a certain way we should be living, and there's a certain way to, to do things. And this is what he says. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So peace, that's a good thing. Holiness is another good thing. But notice he doesn't just say peace. Because we can imagine if, if you just said, hey, be at peace with everyone. What about when people aren't being so holy or good? Does that mean you just go along with it and, and you ignore holiness? And, and not at all. Holiness needs to be added to that. Our goal is not to just be at peace with people, but to be at peace insofar as it's consistent with holiness. We, when people are doing something wrong, we may have to be in disagreement with them. But peace and holiness are, are very special things, and we can, can imagine why he would tell us to, to be both. Why should we strive for peace? Well, peace is a bit of a, uh, well, it's one of those things that truly is a blessing, but when you don't have peace, it can cause a real struggle within and among the people of God. And maybe some of what he says later on is helpful for that. Now, I, should, I was going to note also that the word for, for peace, or rather for holiness, hagiasmon, is, is that word that we might find familiar, hagia, hagia Sophia, the whole Church of Holy Wisdom, you may have heard of that. But that's that word for holiness, because we're going to come to a contrasting word for unholy a little later on here. But keep that in the back of your mind for a minute. What does that mean? Why do we want peace? Why do we want holiness? And what does that look like? Well, he says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, 
that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Now we could imagine how uh, when people offend other people, a root of bitterness, uh, like bitterness, the starting point, the root of bitterness starts and then it grows into something. All it takes is somebody to uh, offending someone in some subtle way and then that person wants to offend them back and then they keep that and you may never forget what that person said. And before long, over time, a community of people will carry that with them until you build up more, a longer and longer list of all the offensive things that anyone has ever said to you. And then how much of a community do you have? How much, what kind of a church is that going to be like when we've got that root of bitterness there? So the life of the church really does uh, depend on peace, a people uh, being willing to forgive, people moving on and saying, I'm not going to hold that against someone because I don't want that wrong thing that someone did to me to become a root of bitterness and for something bigger to grow out of that. That's the last thing we would want to have happen. And, and maybe the, on a practical level, the first thing we can do, is, uh, aside from being a troublemaker and trying to push people's buttons, is simply being ready to forgive, ready to not take offense quickly. You know, some people could even say something that's borderline offensive, but we just jump at it, say, hey, why did Chris say that? You know? Oh, and now I'm sorry, I'm not trying to use you, offend you as an, as an example there, just because you're back after a couple of months, right? But you might wonder sometimes, what are, you know, it's possible to take something the wrong way, is it not? Have you ever said something and you said, oh boy, that didn't sound very good the way I said that? We've all been there. But people have probably said things that didn't say, come out the right way, and then we don't feel so good about it. And then we think, well, huh, I wonder what, what little jab I could take at them next time. And, and things build up. And, and then you get a root of bitterness. It doesn't help the church at all. So that's one side of it, the piece. Of, and, and really just not taking offense is an important piece of that. But what about this other part, holiness? What is holiness, really? If you go around, uh, you won't talk to a lot of people who talk about holiness a lot, at least not outside of the church context. But a big part of holiness is simply living for God, living differently. Holiness is, is a big part of, of being separate and different from other people. When God was uh, holy, and he de demonstrated his holiness with the, the tabernacle and the temple and the courtyards, there were boundaries and rituals and, 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 and distance between the people and God. Even though he was in the middle of the camp of the ta with the tabernacle, there were boundaries of holiness. And so that tells us that we should be different from the world. As Christians, we don't look at, hey, what's everybody doing? How do I jump on that bandwagon or that other bandwagon? That's not the Christian approach. Now, it doesn't mean we have to be really strange. Okay, it doesn't mean we have to be extra strange. You know, we, we can be, we should be different, but we should be different in the right way. And what is that way? I don't mean a tinfoil hat or anything like that. No. We want to be different in holiness, in really following God, in doing what God wants us to do, living for God. That's going to be different from people not living for God. That'll set us apart. Now, the example given here is sexual immorality. And that's probably one of the, the morals or, or categories of morality that is slightly different from others in that if you steal from someone someone's going to notice and they're going to come looking for you. Or if you uh, hurt someone physically, they're going to come looking for you. Sexual immorality has this tendency to be one of those commands that people could say, hey, well, at least I didn't hurt anyone. And it's easy to brush off, sweep under the rug, ignore. And the reality is, is that that sets us apart as Christians from a lot of the world, which has said, hey, There'll, there'll be laws about not hurting other people and, you know, not stealing from other people. Even you can't lie about other people. And when you look at the Ten Commandments and that second table of the law, which you could summarize as saying honor uh, people and thought, word, and deed, you know, in terms of their uh, 
physical well-being, their prosperity, their reputation, and their chastity. Chastity is probably the first thing that the world's going to toss aside and say, who cares about that? You're not hurting anybody. But the Bible does come back to it again and again because it's so easy to skip along. And that word there is pornos, which refers, actually the masculine word, which in uh, the feminine word would be prostitution, like prostitute, porneia. But that word would be anyone, you know? Anyone, any general form of sexual immorality. And then it goes on to an example of Esau. Now, I think that the word unholy is really what's referring to Esau because I don't think that uh, Esau was specifically immoral in other ways. But the example here uh, is his unholiness in selling his birthright for a single meal. Now, you can find that in Genesis 27. And the word for unholy there is bebelos, which you'll note is not the negation of the word holy in terms of hagia holy. You can see the Greek, it's a little bit different. But that Greek word there is referring to going over the threshold, really living in profanity, not recognizing the difference between the boundaries of things. And he, here was someone who was the oldest son who was supposed to get the birthright as the firstborn, and he just didn't seem to care. He was supposed to get the, his birthright. He was supposed to get the blessing. He was the one that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, it, would, it, was, it was supposed to go to Esau, right? He was supposed to be the one who would get that, that blessing. And he said, well, I'm hungry. He just didn't care. And it's easy for us to kind of say, well, here are the important things, and I don't care about the rest. Or, or just profane things and say, well, this is supposed to be holy, but it's not that holy to me. And that's what went, where Esau went wrong. But there's a warning there that, you know, there are things, mistakes we can make, things we can break that we can't fix. And once he lost that blessing, once the blessing was given to his brother, Jacob, Esau went back and said, Dad, can I have the blessing? He's like, sorry, I already blessed your brother and I can't unbless him. So all I can do is kind of bless you with what's left over. And it didn't matter how much he cried or, or realized the error of his way. Some things you just can't undo. And so there's a little bit of a reminder, like so much of Hebrews, which says, hey, stick with it. Don't give up. Endure. Keep going. Okay. And that's a, a reminder of that through Hebrews. But what can we do? Well, we can strive for peace in the community. We can strive for holiness by keeping God's law, keeping his commandments. That's how we show our love for God. And why should we do that? Well, we should do that because we are in the new covenant. And so we see the two mountains. There's a contrast. Maybe you didn't catch it the first time. But uh, that first mountain that's mentioned with the, all the details of smoke and tr the sound of a trumpet and so on. Where is that coming from? Well, you will find that in the Old Testament coming from Exodus chapter 19. When Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel, God said to Moses. So this is a covenant that he's making at the mountain. This is the old covenant. But remember, the requirement is what? Keep my commandments. God wants to make a holy nation, a holy kingdom, but it, the, the requirement is one that was not kept. He continued on, though. They were at the mountain, remember? So Moses came and called the elders of the people, set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him, and all the people, what did they say? Well, this is too hard. We're not into this covenant. Not at all. They said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And then we skip ahead to 16, and it says, on the morning of the third day, there were what? Thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain and it was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. 
and the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And God had told them that nothing can approach the, the mountain. This is sacred. This is, any animal that approached would be stoned. Any person as well. The people were in, now in this realm of this mountain and all this stuff is happening. Now, if I could put that on my YouTube video, that's what I'd want, right? That's what will get us all the views. That's amazing, isn't it? Just imagine a, a mountain on fire and the sound of a trumpet that's getting louder and louder and things are shaking and you know people will watch an earthquake video probably before they'll click on a sermon video right it's, that would be pretty amazing but here's what the the author of hebrews says that this is not what we've come to it's not like that what we've got now he says you have not come to what may be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages may be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. That's the mountain of Mount Sinai. And we could read that in Exodus and say, wow, that would be amazing and a wondrous sight to behold. But here the Hebrews author is saying, you did not come to that. You did not experience that. Instead, you've come to something else. But is it lesser or is it greater? Well, you didn't come to that. You came to something greater. He says in, in 18, you have not come to what may be touched, Mount Sinai, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all. You have come, in fact, to something greater. Now, if you were to come to church on a Sunday, you're not going to see all the smoke and the fire and the shaking earth and the sound of a trumpet getting louder and louder. But you've actually come to something greater than that. You can't see it. You can't see that reality. You don't see the angels right now. You, you don't see those who are... In the assembly of the firstborn, the firstborn being the, those who are to inherit eternal life. You, can't, you don't see God. But he's saying in the new covenant, in Christ, you have come to this mountain, Mount Zion, with the spiritual reality, with all of these amazing things. The spirits of the righteous made perfect. We've joined with in the community of faith, in the communion of the saints on earth and in heaven, we are a part of something even bigger and more amazing than the Israelites could have seen or felt or touched with their hands. We have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Abel's blood spoke from the ground, but Christ's blood speaks forgiveness and eternal life for those who enter into this new covenant who are consecrated into that new covenant in him and it's invisible and so to the outside world i'm just someone talking behind this wooden pulpit you know with a black speaker beside me on a shelf not too extraordinary right people would say show me the mountain on fire all the smoke, an earthquake, that's what people want to see. But what we have now, although not as visibly significant, is actually much bigger, much more important. And trying to think of examples of how this is the case is hard to do. I was thinking, huh, how do you compare that? Well, maybe uh, I could think of when I was, when I graduated from university and I was ordained, there was a big ceremony and stuff. But do you know how much preaching I'd done? Do you know how much ministry I'd done when I started out? Basically nothing. And so now years go by, decades, more than decades gone by. I've done way more 
ministry and work for God since then, but I'm probably not going to have a big ceremony where, you know, people lay their hands on me and say, hey, you're, you're doing the Lord's work. Same might go for any profession where you go to school, you graduate, there's this big celebration, you throw your hats in the air, and then you actually get to work and do stuff. When I got my first degree, my BA, they said, oh, I think the chancellor said something like, oh, you should be proud of yourself, you've accomplished a lot. And I'm thinking, and I thought about it, I was like, no, I haven't. <laughs> I did my homework, I did my assignments, I jumped through some hoops, but I haven't really done all that much yet. And the reality uh, really followed what, what seemed to be all celebratory and big at the time. What looked bigger actually represented something yet to come, something better to come. And the new covenant is, is that much greater than the old covenant. The old covenant was a temporary thing. It was a good thing, but it wasn't forever. The new covenant is forever. It's amazing. And, and so that's why we're reminded for this, that if... The, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we, we reject him who warns from heaven. So we've got a, a heavenly warning, and it outweighs the earthly warning. If they were fearful and careful, we should be even more so, given the spiritual reality of this covenant we acknowledge, that we are part of. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. That's taken from Haggai 2, 6, and of course in 7. And just for a little context, he's saying, But for thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all the nations... Uh, shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. But in shaking the nations to bless his nation, this is my sermon when it gets in the notes sometimes, <laughs> the idea is now that God's nation would be shaken too. His nation, his kingdom would remain unshaken. And the glory being brought into his house from the nations seems to be echoed in Romans, Revelation rather, 21. Maybe you heard this. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. This is, what is it talking about there in Revelation 21? Well, the city of God, the bride adorned for the husband. As it says at the beginning of that chapter, in verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Sounds like they're shaken, old things are taken away, and there's something eternal instead. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. God has this uh, image. Well, here we have a vision of God's plan of a greater kingdom, an eternal kingdom that will not end in the new heavens and new earth. This is not a temporary thing. And what is his argument then? But that yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. He doesn't say, I'm going to shake all the nations and bring their treasures and blessings to you, and you're going to be shaken as well. No, he's saying to his nation that they won't be shaken. And likewise, when you're saying there's something shaken, this kingdom is not going to be shaken. There's something that's eternal, that's not physical, that's going to last forever. This is the kingdom that will last. It's the kingdom of God. And it's for everyone who comes to God through Jesus Christ. Then we receive a place in his eternal kingdom as he concludes here. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So it all leads up to what? Well, we've got this living a peaceful and holy life, very important, but we want to recognize that we're part of a covenant, and we are, experience a spiritual reality that no one can see, but what's that going to do to us? It means that we're going to be grateful, of course, that we're a part of this, 
unshakable kingdom. But let us then offer to God acceptable worship. In other words, let's not think that any old worship will do. That I can not be so peaceful and I can be not so holy and that worship is just as good as if I'm peaceful and holy. Because that's not the same. The worship that's acceptable to God is from people who are seeking peace in his church and who are living a holy life. Not people who live in sin and say, well, I'll just go through the motions at church, but people who are really growing in holiness and developing that peace. And then they can go to church, they can go to worship and offer to God acceptable worship. Not like God's just like anyone else or, hey, I like God, but you know, I like a lot of other things too. Not at all. It's a complete and supreme love for God. And so we approach him with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. God is amazing. But we can't see it, so we forget about that. Or we think, hey, worship, we can do that every week. Not a big deal. It's the wrong idea. It's amazing. We just can't see it, but it is amazing. So what can we see in this contrast of the covenants? Well, we're in it, the new covenant. And so we want to live that peaceful and holy life. We, we want to follow God's ways and, and really not take offense by what other people say. But being holy, what will that do for us? Well, it allows us to worship God. Psalm 24 says it well. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. God makes us holy. God washes us clean. God makes it so we can, in fact, ascend his hill, Mount Zion, and praise him in true spirit. Over these past months, and even in this past year, after long periods of separation, we've gained a sense of how special church is, I think. Just a glimpse of it. You know, if, we, if there's a time for worship every Sunday, every week, we can put that aside. And now, even today, when things are online, it's even easier to say, well, I could watch that video in a couple of weeks. You know, I don't have any priority. It takes even more discipline to set that time aside when it's not on somebody else's schedule. But worship is amazing. Worship is special all the time, every week, every time we can do it, it's, it's amazing. We just, you, just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not true. And so what can we do as we live a peaceable and holy life, recognize the invisible splendor of God and the majesty of his presence to see worship for what it is? And then with reverence and awe, you'll be able to offer worship that's acceptable and pleasing to our amazing God, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to see thy grace. Streams of mercy Daily I'm constrained.
going to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, go oh, take and seal it. Now let us go through our week with an awareness of the great majesty of God and with God's blessing. May the love of God our Father and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.